Hello. Hello. Hi, Dish. Hi. Sorry, uh, I had some serious difficulty joining. Uh, so, uh, you can probably share the screen. Uh, yeah, you can share the screen. So, we'll wait for one more minute and we'll start. Maybe yeah. by that, then you can share. Okay. We can see the screen. Okay. okay. So Yeah, they're sure. So when you're ready, let us know so we can start, I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay, can you hear me well? Because I'm not yeah. able to start my video. It doesn't matter for me. No, no, we can hear you. Hmm. Because your yes. voice is very feeble. Uh, okay. Maybe because of the rain here. Dish, I, I can hear you well. Dish, you're clear, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So let me just reduce the noise. Yeah, I think that has improved. All right. Okay. Uh, can I start? Yeah, sure. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, today, we will talk briefly about the context uh, associated with the experiments you're doing. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the, the radio astronomy techniques and re about radio, radio telescopes and so on and so forth. Uh, I might take you through just a little bit of uh, basics uh, just to uh, put things in context about the radio waves and what we are looking at. Uh, 
uh, how how do the signals appear to us of course the signals that you have been using for uh, uh, doing the experiments are man made signals uh, we will be looking at uh, in, in astronomy studies we will be looking at uh, natural sources and uh, they have uh, certain characteristics that they uh, in which they differ distinctly from uh, uh, the nature of uh, man made sources uh, so uh, let me start this uh, okay you can probably see my uh, ppt slide yeah the we can see okay. all right so i'm um, uh, these are the two experiments you people have been doing uh, or been uh, introduced to inverse square law uh, and back reflector uh, effect of back reflector uh, the first one requires no explanation really for all of you uh, who are very familiar with uh, the way the intensity is expected to fall uh, as the um, as the distance increases from the source uh, and uh, it is simply conservation of the total flux uh, emanating from the source uh, which when divided by the area through which it's crossing uh, as the distance increases that area increases as um, uh, proportional to the distance square and the uh, the intensity or the flux density uh, falls uh, uh, as one upon uh, distance square so uh, and the second one is more related to the way uh, we use profitably uh, certain um, arrangements around the uh, antennas uh, which we will look at some examples of uh such a way that we get uh, preferential uh, boosting uh, of our response uh, in in certain directions of interest so uh let me begin with a very broad uh, uh, statement about the uh, the agenda we have as a uh, as an astronomer in general not necessarily radio astronomer uh and stated in a somewhat trivialized words uh, what we are interested in is measuring intensity or number of photons as a function of direction and here the direction would require two sky coordinates to define a particular direction uh also as a function of uh, color or wavelength or frequency whatever uh, terminology you might like uh of the electromagnetic waves uh, and we would like to see how this is changing if at all it does uh, as a function of time and if we have the luxury and interest we would also like to know the polarization state of this uh, radiation that we receive and so for each one of these entities uh, we can define a resolution and span and uh, uh, much like the way you do when you buy a camera uh, Uh, you ask what the what angle it can cover uh, with what resolution i can see the image or capture the image uh, that is very straightforward in the case of uh, directions uh, we can also see what the color palette is how detailed uh, the colors are described uh, and whether it can deal with intensities which are very high uh, and low uh, simultaneously or not um, so that would define the span in the intensity uh, without saturating the picture uh, and being able to see the faintest uh, light uh, so that sort of uh, defines the uh, the three uh, uh, contexts of intensity direction and frequency and then of course if things are changing as a function of time you would like to instead of a still picture you would like to take a movie and so it's set of frames uh, much like the still pictures uh, taken at regular intervals which when combined uh, will reveal the uh, variation across time uh, so that's what uh, one is up to essentially and uh, what we are after is to of course have largest span and uh, finest resolution in each one of them 
and basically these two parameters, uh, these two attributes for each one of these entities uh, together define an attribute of a instrument that we are using. Okay, uh, this I'm not going to spend much time. Uh, you must have seen this um, spectrum several times, uh, showing the, the the extent of the electromagnetic spectrum going all the way, uh, starting from radio waves all the way to gamma rays. Uh, but what I'm going to stress upon is the uh, is the difference between radio and the more familiar uh, setting that we are uh, we encounter in optical uh, wavelengths. We are used to using, uh, for example, detectors. Uh, it's a common term used in optical uh, uh, wavelengths. There, we are appealing to uh, the photon doing something interesting uh, to the material on which it falls. Uh, however, uh, given the radio wavelengths being so long and the frequencies correspondingly being so small, the individual photon energies, which is uh, given by uh, H times nu, uh, H being the Planck constant, uh, you will find that the radio photons are too weak to be detectable individually uh, or to cause any reaction to the detector or any material that is exposed, uh, where that final action can be uh, detected as a sort of, you know, in the photoelectric effect, you have uh, an electron knocked off, uh, which you can uh, uh, sense and uh, even count the number of photons. But here we are uh, left with no such detectors, uh, but the electromagnetic radiation uh, falling on a piece of metal might uh, or will induce uh, motions of electrons uh, proportional to the incident electromagnetic uh, electric field of the electromagnetic wave. And uh, uh, if we have large uh, photon density, uh, we can uh, sense these oscillations as fluctuations in the current and which we, which we uh, often amplify and record. So, uh, as I said, individual photon energies are too small uh, at radio wavelengths. Uh, um, and even if we have a swarm of a billion radio photons, it cannot free an electron from, a, from its atom uh, or initiate uh, photochemical changes uh, in the material. So, uh, that's why we have uh, devices to sense uh, radio waves, uh, which we call antennas, which are just pieces of metal. Of course, the shapes and sizes and all the details about this uh, metal piece uh, govern the way it is going to respond to uh, photons of certain energy uh, and uh, how it's going to respond to radiation coming from different directions. So this is the general picture, which is very familiar. Uh, we have uh, parallel rays uh, coming from uh, certain direction uh, or in principle from all directions, but if we consider those and have a nice uh, collector of light, uh, which might concentrate uh, the signal coming from a certain direction at, the, at some uh, chosen place, uh, like the focus, um, we need a certain shape of this reflector uh, and to ensure that they all arrive in phase uh, at this, uh, oh, I'm just trying to find my cursor, uh, okay, here, yeah. So at the focus, you put the sensor that we said, uh, like an antenna or a piece of metal, which uh, we will appeal to for uh, sensing the fluctuating current associated with it. So what this signal really looks like, uh, of course, we take this signal then amplify it uh, and then record it uh, once it's amplified enough to be able to record uh, uh, with high fidelity. And uh, we might then do something about it, uh, either in terms of analysis or display it in certain fashion. But the nature of this uh, signal is really uh, of random Gaussian white noise, okay? What uh, is noise for somebody, uh, particularly the communications people, uh, uh, is our signal, 
and uh, if you were to imagine how it will look uh, it will look like the old time picture of on the uh, uh, crt tubes that you would uh, get in olden days where the station had switched off the signal and you would get some speckly pattern uh, and so that's the kind of picture uh, one should have in mind about the uh, the nature of the signal it will look uh, won't have any systematicness um, as a function of time uh, or across uh, uh, even from one frequency to another frequency um, it will be completely random but what we are interested in is the variance of this noise and that's what is proportional to the intensity that we are after so uh, one can rigorously of course show that photons follow bose einstein statistics um, so uh, they of course bosons and the statistics that they follow is a combination of two random processes one is the expected number of photons at any given time which might vary randomly at intervals where the the changes significant changes can take place which is the uh, given by the interval which is uh, proportional to the or equal to the inverse of the bandwidth so of course uh, you have fluctuations in the intensity thanks to a finite bandwidth if the bandwidth were to be zero which there is no uh, practical case of it uh, you will find the intensity is steady which is a monochromatic wave which is only a hypothetical uh, situation so in general you will have this uh, number of photons varying uh, in a fashion which follows uh, exponential distribution you can also write the same thing for uh, the number of photons uh, and this is called the wave like uh, noise uh, and we can also imagine that to be a superposition of large number of sinusoids uh, when they uh, add in phase you will get uh, large intensities uh, when they uh, when the sinusoids uh, happen to cancel or uh, reduce the the net field uh, you will find the intensity is low so this uh, is the situation uh, where the real and imaginary parts of the uh, received field follow strictly gaussian statistics and it is the variance of this uh, uh, gaussian distribution uh, description that we are after which is also proportional to the number of photons but when we put when we expect so many uh, photons uh, per whatever per unit area and we put uh, make two such uh, measurements of the same field you will find although the number expected was uh, uh, something um, you will uh, on the average you expect n uh, average uh, n in triangular brackets but at any one time you will get uh n prime let's say but even that n prime will uh be the mean expectation and two observers with identical conditions where they expect n prime might see different number of photons and that's just the counting fluctuation uh and thus that will follow poissonian distribution so you will have combination of these two uh resulting in the uh in the actual number that one will see of course you can uh, knowing these two contributors you can write the total fluctuation that you will see nn as one due to the uh, the exponential distribution uh, where the mean and uh, uh, the mean and uh, standard deviation are the same uh, whereas uh, in the poissonian distribution the mean and the standard deviation uh, the variances are same so if you combine this you will find that the variance total a number of photons uh, this way this coming from the uh, the wave noise and this coming from the counting noise of course you can see that depending on the the typical values of n uh, the dominance of the relative dominance of these two terms uh, will be decided and you will find in the rayleigh gene regime where we are mostly uh, almost uh, always 
uh, we will find that the wave noise dominates. At optical wavelengths, on the other side, uh, on the other hand, uh, you will find that we are uh, we have dearth of photons, uh, and we will find uh, at least in the in the astronomical context, of course. And so it will be uh, the the RMS noise will be uh, dominated by the the counting statistics, where uh, it will be square root of uh, the number of photons expected. Okay. <laughs> Now I made this statement uh, what, uh, that we are in the Rayleighian regime, uh, and that's uh, because uh, you will find that uh, even for the the weakest radiation that uh, we receive, which is uh, cosmic microwave background, uh, 2.7 degree Kelvin, if you look at uh, the, the Planck curve, you will find that you are in this uh, Rayleighian regime uh, for almost the entire part of the uh, radio uh, spectrum. You will also see that uh, the number of photons expected per uh, phase space bin uh, uh, is increasing rapidly towards lower frequencies. And so we are uh, truly in the regime of uh, uh, NS much larger than one. You can compare these cases uh, in, in the context of various um, sources and how bright they are and so on and so forth. You will find from a bright source like uh, Signal A, uh, <clears throat> you will find uh, you get huge number of uh, uh, photons uh, in a phase space cell. Whereas in comparison, even with the HST, uh, for uh, one of the brightest sources, uh, you will get only few photons uh, per phase space cell. <clears throat> I might lose the connection. Lynch? We can't hear you. I guess there is a problem with Desh audio, so, but we can see his screen. Yeah, I guess there, there is a power failure in his area. We'll wait for two minutes. Let's see whether he will join. Jami, do you want to just call him and check? Uh, yeah, I'm missing his call only. Just a second. Ah, I had got disconnected. I'm just rejoining. Thanks. Hello? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Sorry, uh, I got knocked out because of the power failure here. Uh, I hope I am able to... Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Desh. You can hear me? Okay, I'm yeah, right. yeah. Do you see my screen again or not yet? Uh, no, no, not yet. Okay, now? Uh, Still not yet. Okay, I might have to share it again, maybe. Okay, yeah, are you able to see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, I apologize for the interruption. Uh, I had feared that this would happen because of the rains. Uh, okay. Uh, I think this is where I was uh, comparing Peter yeah. Juice yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so on. So, uh, 
So even if, uh, of course, one can say that what happens to a, a source, uh, if I take uh, uh, a very weak source uh, or take Cygnus A and, and move it to even farther, uh, and of course, its uh, photon density would fall. Uh, and uh, what would happen then? That's where we are saved by the uh, fact that there is always persistent radiation uh, from the uh, cosmic microwave background, and it will always ensure that our uh, uh, number of photons that we receive uh, is much, much larger than one uh, at, uh, you know, all the wavelengths of uh, relevance in radio. <clears throat> okay, uh, so given this, that the sky is not dark in the radio wavelengths, uh, we uh, are ensured that we have large number of photons. We are almost bathing in photons. Uh, radio photons. And so given this classical C of uh, noise, uh, we should uh, derive the benefit from it. And that the biggest benefit we have is that we can define the phase very uh, meaningfully. Uh, for uh, in our optical wavelengths where you get just one photon, uh, you know, once in a while from a particular source, uh, the f uh, or that's those the only photons you have, um, you cannot really define the phase. You can try to, but the uncertainty in the phase is, uh, is overwhelmed by the Poissonian uh, noise. So the general picture is like this. Uh, the radiation density is, uh, is where the, the each packet or each uh, uh, section of the train that uh, the bogies that we receive or see at any given, uh, from any given location are populated uh, uh, well with number of photons. Um, and they, of course, will fluctuate. But there is never a dearth of photons. And these new, new pieces of information or independent pieces of information are available to us at intervals of time, which is inverse of the bandwidth. Uh, uh, whereas exactly, uh, you know, uh, uh, something similar to the situation occurs in optical where we have uh, occupation number much less than one. We on the average have photons less than unity. And so you will find given the, the quantized nature uh, of the photons uh, uh, of this energy, you will see uh, once in a while a few photon or two uh, and so most of the uh, bogies will be uh, empty. So the important point uh, of all this is that at radio wavelengths, we can safely use wave description and profitably, profitably measure the field directly, the electric field, the uh, electric uh, field component of the electromagnetic radiation we receive. And the most precious uh, information in terms of phase uh, becomes available along with the amplitude and suddenly lots of things become possible, which otherwise are difficult to uh, accomplish. Uh, because now we can make phase sensitive measurements of even the arrival direction uh, uh, for any particular so uh, I mean, of the signals that we get from different directions. Uh, you can ask what this, uh, how do we justify that we have Gaussian uh, statistics? Um, you can appeal to central limit theorem. You can imagine large number of sources contributing to the signal. Each one of them, even if they are doing following very different statistics, uh, as long as they are uncorrelated with each other, you can show that uh, in the limit, you will get Gaussian statistics as a combined statistics of uh, uh, or statistics of the combined signal. So. Uh, uh, I think uh, that is very easy to imagine. Uh, you are, whenever you're looking in any direction, even uh, with finite resolution, you're looking at a, a cone uh, going all the way to wherever you can receive uh, up to the distance that you can receive radiation. And uh, you will find that all those uh, radiators within that sector, uh, within that solid angle are contributing. <coughs> Okay, so uh, while we would like to uh, have uh, 
the measurements that we specified, we want to measure the variance of this noise uh, as a function of two sky coordinates, frequency, which is color, time, uh, which is the, any variability that might exist, and polarization, as I mentioned earlier. We have this uh, 12 uh, numbers, uh, which we would like to define at will, really. Uh, but that's not possible. And it's not possible because of the interdependence of these uh, various parameters, uh, which stop us from uh, being uh, able to specify each one of them to uh, our desire. Uh, for example, there will be uh, there will be some uncertainty relations, uh, uh, which will limit the angular resolution and uh, the positional. Uh, allowance that we allow. Uh, so this is like the, the momentum equivalent and this is like the position equivalent in the uncertainty principle. So they will have, uh, the, there will be some minimum common ambiguity that will exist, which we cannot beat. So we cannot have uh, small uh, preciseness of where the photon fell uh, on our aperture and at the same time have high angular resolution, for example. There are of course other relations uh, which uh, uh, we will not talk about unless there are questions, uh, but this one, which is brightness distribution in the sky being related to uh, spatial coherence function allows us to actually make uh, beautiful images of the sky by not having a big single uh, telescope or aperture. Okay, but these uh, constraints that come from uncertainty principle are relevant even for a single photon case, not just uh, for waves, like the way we would like to treat the radio signals. Uh, you will find that you can derive this uh, very simply by taking the, uh, the X component of the momentum of uh, photons arriving at some angle and the uncertainty in that can be, uh, assuming there's no uncertainty in the frequency, uh, you can see that if you allow for delta x to be the uncertainty in the position, uh, you can uh, constrain the direction to uh, a certain level. And that is given by this famous relation, uh, lambda upon d. Uh, so that's your diffraction formula. Similar constraints uh, will be there in, uh, in the time and frequency resolutions, uh, which together uh, cannot be the, the product cannot be less than unity. So we already looked at this. Uh, uh, of course, then given all these constraints, we are asked uh, what the, you know, what decides our sensitivity, how faint uh, objects can we detect? And that depends on the number of photons that are collected by the bucket you might uh, uh, put to collect these photons per sample. Per sample means uh, the, uh, each sample, each piece of independent information is decided by uh, the time duration corresponding to uh, inverse of the bandwidth. So where the time bandwidth product is unity. And so you getting independent pieces of information at every interval of inverse of the bandwidth. And if you observe for certain duration T, then T divided by uh, one upon nu, uh, one upon delta nu will give you the number of independent samples. And that turns out to be the famous time bandwidth product, which dictates essentially the sensitivity of your measurements. Remember that the kind of signals we are looking at are extremely weak. Uh, they are, in fact, to describe them, uh, a unit has been defined, which, which is more sensible, uh, uh, you know, more commensurate or more closer to the order of magnitude of the signals that we receive. And that is one Jansky, uh, named after a uh, person who uh, uh, is a father of uh, radio astronomy, is 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter square per hertz. And so you can see that how much, if you, even if you keep a big bucket in terms of area, and use large bandwidth, you will find that you will collect still a very small uh, 
amount of signal. And that's what happens in, uh, in big telescopes. Uh, I will skip over this right now. Um, this is a situation where you, uh, that's the situation you encounter when you're doing those experiments where you have intensity dominating everything else, uh, other sources of noises. And so the level to which you will be able to measure your signal is simply decided by how well you have averaged the signal, how many independent pieces of information you have used. And uh, the fractional accuracy will depend on one upon square root of the number of independent samples you used. And that's why when I advised you to uh, wait for a while and uh, you know let the value stabilize or take it with longer integration if there is any uh, facility like that available. Uh, okay, so antennas are integral part of the receivers, of course. Uh, as we said, uh, we have no other ways of measuring uh, radio signals. Uh, they, of course, we need to select the range of frequencies that we uh, uh, want to look at. We might want to combine the signal coming from various components of whatever aperture you might build, it might contain uh, several uh, pieces of metal uh, and we might uh, sense, use the uh, different sensors and combine their signals with appropriate uh, phase shifts and uh, delays. So uh, in general, what we are interested in is to collect uh, signals from whatever area that we can access. Uh, or would like to have and combine those pieces in phase appropriate for the signal coming from a certain direction. So uh, now you will say all this is where you know uh, we are look, we are considering the receiving situation. We receive the signals, um, uh, but whereas our, the, our experiments are. Uh, you know, mainly illustrating the properties associated with the radiators. Uh, so how does this work? One important uh, uh, aspect to appreciate in, um, in these signals is that uh, there is complete reciprocity uh, assured and also implicitly assumed here, where whatever we uh, see as a case in transmission uh, is also true in uh, reception. Of course, this is true strictly in the in case of uh, fields. And then, of course, we can trivially get the intensities and so on and so forth. But in certain cases, uh, they can also be translated to intensities. Certain cases uh, where the reciprocity fails is where we uh, do some operations like uh, interferometry operations where we multiply signals uh, from the two, uh, which uh, there is no analog of it in the transmission. So uh, we of course know that uh, whenever uh, we have a shaped reflector, like a parabolic reflector, we have point focus, uh, but it's never a point. Uh, although in ray tracing uh, descriptions, uh, we can uh, show them as crossing a particular point uh, after reflection from a paraboloid surface. But uh, what is operative there is really physical optics and uh, you will find that it has a finite area over which uh, this uh, the rays will produce uh, or spread their signal and that is given by again the uncertainty principle associated with um, the angular uh, definition or uh, resolution you will have uh, given the size of the aperture. So uh, we have already talked about this. Uh, you can see if you uh, eliminate uh, the aperture in a certain way uh, that will dictate the far field diffraction pattern and you can manipulate the way you want to look at the sky by uh, arranging your uh, uh, distribution of across the aperture. So I will uh, probably just mention a variety of structures, antennas uh, 
on the ground uh, we uh, we have either we can just place them on the ground and looking up or we can put them at the focus of uh, suitably shaped reflectors uh, you can have wire antennas you can have 2d or 3d structures uh, uh, you know, simplest of those are uh, simple uh, resonant dipoles, uh, half-wave dipoles or helical antennas. You can make arrays of antennas and uh, get them to uh, get the signals from uh, the different pieces of the array uh, uh, added in certain way uh, and by appropriately arranging for the phase shifts before combining them you can steer uh, the directivity, the directional response of this array in different, different directions. Of course, when you have a shaped reflector, um, parabolic or spherical, uh, you can also have a hyperbolic uh, secondary reflector to bring the signal to a convenient place. Uh, but these are all mechanically spherical uh, structures uh, like this. Uh, and uh, you can show that uh, uh, you will have to, uh, there will be a permanent arrangement of where the sensor is uh, and so on and so forth. And based on the shape of the reflector, you will find uh, uh, the way uh, whether things add in phase or not uh, will be decided. And that will effectively decide how much of this surface area uh, you're actually using. But those are matters of details. Uh, there are uh, large number of Indian radio telescopes uh, where uh, you will see various examples of it. Uh, you will, uh, the, the old Kalyan solar heliograph that uh, Sarup and uh, collaborators had used had these dishes with uh, at the focus uh, a sensor. So that this is the antenna and this is just the reflector. In Gauri Bidno telescope, uh, which is 80 kilometers from Bangalore, you have a big, uh, very low frequencies, so long dipoles uh, arranged uh, with the support of these wooden poles. You can hardly see the dipoles uh, because of the thinness of the wires. But uh, you will find that they are simple uh, dipoles arranged in an array form, uh, which goes on for one and a half kilometer. Uh, you can, uh, th there is a similar one uh, that used to be in Mauritius where the helical antennas were used. And in all these, uh, you will find uh, there is a reflector at the, you know, below this dipoles, blocking the radiation coming from uh, the, the ground, as well as reflecting the radiation coming from the sky in a manner that adds coherently or in phase with the radiation that is received directly by the dipoles. Uh, there was a millimeter wave telescope uh, at RRI, which required uh, the reflector to be very smooth because it had to work well at very uh, short wavelengths, uh, millimeter waves. And so the, essentially the smoothness has to be of the order of, uh, at the level of, as a rule of thumb, uh, 20 times smaller than the wavelength. You can show that rigorously uh, from seeing how much loss of signal would occur if it was rougher than lambda by 20. Uh, so you can already see that uh, the reflector uh, in Gauri Bidnur for a wavelength which is about 10 meters doesn't have to be very smooth. So in fact, uh, you will see that the reflector is simply made of wires which are placed with separations which are about half a meter. And they could be you know, small ups and downs uh, of the order of few uh, tens of centimeters which do not matter. It still acts as a beautiful mirror. Uh, and uh, of course, at some intermediate wavelength, like one meter, uh, which is the example of UT radio telescope, you have a cylindrical dish where the wires are stretched along the length of the array, uh, which reflect uh, and which are adequate to take care of the polarization of interest, which is along the north-south. And at this focus, there is a feed line which has a set of dipoles, which now have been covered with a corner reflector instead of just a flat reflector. 
and that stops the radiation being picked up directly by these dipoles and they uh, primarily look at what is reflected from the surface. Also, the corner reflector ensures that the beam has narrowed down, uh, which means we the dipole does not dipole with the corner reflector does not look at well away from the edge of the primary reflector, and that uh, helps us in reducing the ground pickup. Of course, similar care is taken in big dishes also, and the fineness of the dish, of course, is decided by uh, fineness of the surface of the dish is decided by what wavelength you are operating at or what is the highest uh, frequency you want to operate at, and of course. Uh, in this particular case, there are a set of uh, feeds or sensors uh, which work at different different frequencies. Uh, each one of them is sort of optimized to look only over the area of the dish and not beyond it because if it were to look well beyond it with significant uh, response, you would see that you would pick up the ground temperature. So these are, uh, you know, uh, various examples of... Uh, the line and point focus, uh, as we saw, uh, the paraboloid uh, reflectors uh, give you a point focus, whereas uh, you will find uh, a cylindrical dish will give you a line focus. And here, uh, there is no uh, concept of focus because we are sensing separately pieces of radiation falling at different locations and we are combining everything electronically after that. So that's uh, similar concepts are becoming more and more popular because it's easy to build those arrays and particularly at low frequencies. Okay, I might uh, probably stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Please raise your hands if you have any doubt or questions. Probably no questions. Because I don't see any hands raised. No, even I don't see John. Okay. Uh, are any doubts uh, from the experiments if you have done uh, like recently? And if you have any difficulties uh, while doing the experiment or uh, if you want to share anything, so you are most welcome to share. There's a question in the chat. What do you mean by white noise? Okay. Uh, yeah, so the whiteness, the way we understand uh, in colors uh, is where uh, white color is made of uh, sort of roughly equal contribution from all the colors in the on the palette, right? So what it means technically is that the spectral density is uniform across the spectrum. It's constant across the spectrum. And so in the context of radio waves where the, uh, you know, we are not assigning colors per se, uh, because those wavelengths are not visible to us, across a band of uh, frequencies, the spectral density is uniform. If it was a red noise, for example, we would uh, have lower frequencies having higher intensity or higher uh, spectral uh, density. For uh, uh, blue noise, uh, we will have uh, uh, higher frequencies having more intensity. So white noise is basically uniform spectral density. Okay. Which, so although we know that it's strictly not true, because uh, we have, uh, you know, routine examples of 
spectra which are not flat, but over a narrow bandwidth compared to the center frequency, one can make this assumption because the amount by which the spectral density changes within the band is rather negligible. So that's the context in which uh, uh, one is calling it white noise. Is that, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks, Tesh. Uh, Sachin has raised his hand. Okay. Sachin, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'm yeah. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, my question is related to, uh, like, uh, like, suppose uh, I have to make my own, uh, this, um, antenna for, like, uh, tracing all those, uh, of, like, stellar objects in the uh, space. Uh, so my uh, question is that, like, uh, what we use for the telecommunication, like for TV satellites, can I use that dish? Because, like, it has very small diameter. Uh, like, can I use that to make my own uh, antenna for... Yes. Uh, yes. So, sir, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Like, uh, if, if I want to study from my area, like, I live in Mumbai, and here, like, uh, there are many outside homes and many satellites, antenna are there. So if I have to study, so uh, when is a perfect time or to study or those objects? Well, it depends on which objects you are referring to. Uh, but in terms of uh, which time of the day, if that is what uh, you uh, you are referring to, uh, of course, in terms of uh, your first study, what are the sources of radio frequency interference? You... Uh, okay. And then, uh, much like the way we do for uh, any other thing, uh, we choose the quiet time, right? Uh, and of course, that time, the part of the sky that we are interested in should be accessible. But there's certainly no uh, constraint coming uh, from the presence of the sun as much as it does in the optical cases. Okay. Okay, so like, uh, and most time, like, if I have to uh, study the solar uh, atmosphere, right? Yeah. So if I'm studying in the like very populated area during the daytime, right? So, uh, like, how I can like uh, just uh, take those specific uh, re uh, signals to study because uh, yeah. I can like many uh, radiation interfering. Uh, Correct. Correct. That. Correct. So there are two aspects. One is the directionality of your instrument. Suppose you are using the dish that you are, uh, you know, referring to, which uh, if you use it at the frequency at which the receiving system exists, which is, I think, uh, uh, probably the Q band, right? Yes. Uh, and so you can find out what the directionality is by simply taking, uh, considering the wavelength and the dish diameter you have. And that will tell you that you can, you know, uh, concentrate on just the direction of interest okay and from other directions will be attenuated correspondingly okay they'll not be completely cut off but they can be uh, significantly attenuated so that's one way of uh, you know removing the uh, the contamination that can occur from other signals number two you can also see whether uh, uh, in in that band of frequencies you have really uh, interfering signals. Okay. And you might find that uh, there are probably not uh, many. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you suggest some software like uh, where uh, uh, I can uh, like detect all those signals? Like I've seen many of uh, on like uh, videos, like they use uh, something, uh, some software to uh, to trace. Yeah. So I think. Okay. Uh, okay. So. Uh, I think these signals are available uh, finally at, on this table after the first amplification, okay, what is called low noise block. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, people often use that uh, by connecting it to uh, the, uh, what is called a software defined radio, okay. Yeah. Uh, which can plug as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, USB dongle on your laptops or computers. Yes. And uh, there are standard softwares which are available uh, to, uh, you know, record the signals coming like that. So, okay. uh, you can certainly play with it. Uh, 
but just be mindful that uh, you know you are looking at those frequencies uh, and uh, you know you have certain directionality which you can uh, positively exploit uh, you need to go into direction of interest and study these signals then you also need to see that the signals are strong enough and you have a big enough bucket and all that Yes, so like there are a large number of students uh, or uh, even uh, semi-professionals who use such equipment routinely to uh, look at objects like the sun. And we would encourage you to do that as well if, you, if you're inclined. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so... Okay. Uh, Jamil, you want to take the gallery shot now or what? Yeah, I want to take a gallery shot. Uh, Jyotirma has raised his hand, so maybe we'll do that after the gallery shot. Okay. People leave. Okay. So, I uh, request everyone, please, turn on your cameras. But you have to stop sharing the screen first, I think, no? Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, Desh, I request you, please. Turn yeah, on yeah. Screen. So, one minute. Uh, I should... Uh, no, no, I should leave and... No, you don't I... need to leave. You don't need no, to... No, no, I... Because it... I should, uh, it should give me a stop share option, which I'm not getting now. Uh, I guess I don't see your screen share yes, right stop now. Sharing, actually. Yes, stop okay. sharing. All right. So, could I request all of you to put on your videos? Yeah, even in my area, there's a power failure. Okay, my browser is preventing me from sharing the screen. I mean, sharing my video. Okay. So I don't know. Either I can leave and rejoin, or I don't know. you can try to do that while the others are getting. Okay. It. But most people are not on. Not don't have their videos on. I see there are 40 people, 40, 40 people. So, can you hear us? Kumar, Deepa, Nandini, Sandesh. Yeah, please turn on your cameras. Sachin, Soumya. We're still below the halfway mark, I think. Yeah. So some people are saying it's not allowing. Shouldn't be. Father, can you check? Yeah. Uh, no, because uh, it has enabled it, uh, start video. So it may be more problems with the system. Okay. Uh, with their system rather than because here it will be uniform for everybody, you know. Okay. 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 Wait for a minute, and then we'll take it independent of how many can join. I can see three people are turning their cameras. Okay, I'm taking screenshot now. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, Jatirma, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, you can switch off your videos now. Uh, in the second experiment, means uh, radio wave experiment, so that is basically uh, the plot of uh, X versus power with back, with back reflector. Mm -hmm. Jamil, I am. Yeah, you are audible. Go ahead. Yes. So, means, uh, uh, and we are getting, suppose, okay, uh, after cut fitting, it is sinusoidal curve, curve is giving. So, my point is, uh, is suppose, okay, see so this X. So, uh, there will be lambda, and uh, suppose Kx, uh, K into X will be lambda. So, from there, from where we can get a value of, uh, means, lambda, at, uh, that will be connected with the uh, source wavelength in this way. Means, uh, your K, uh, means, for central curve, so there will be on K for this, because it is space variation, spatial variation. So K means lambda. So there will be interconnection with the lambda with the source. Well, wavelength of the source. Is there any connection? Jamir. Uh, so, sorry, ha, Jatirma. Can you repeat it again? My point is, uh, so, uh, so uh, variation of power. Hmm. It's a sinusoidal. So sinusoidal means spatial variation so there will be a lambda wavelengths yes. so is this wavelength is will be connected with the source wavelength yes or actually it, it depend on at what wavelength you are operating like uh, uh, suppose you are operating at 2.4 gigahertz and uh, by how much fraction you are moving at what uh, interval you are moving and uh, like when they are they are in phase, you should get the maxima, and when they are out of phase, you should get the like minimum power. You also need to check: uh, are there any reflection from the surrounding rather than your reflector? So even if you are uh, standing nearby, then also the the, uh, the power may fluctuate. Yes, actually. Okay, then we have, we have cut fitting. So, mm -hmm. means, and uh, means K will be related with the uh, source wavelength? Related to what? Uh, I, source wavelength. Source, source wavelength. wavelength, of course, yeah. I think the source wavelength uh, decides how, uh, you know, what signal you are getting, of course, right? And for that signal, what is the wavelength? Based on which the reflector distance mm -hmm. will uh, play different roles. Uh, my next point is uh, so we have carried out two experiments. Okay, one is inverse square law, another is with the back detector. Right. Then we have again given, uh, give, gave us Wi-Fi analyzer setup uh, for Windows. Suppose uh, this tumbler, that's this, that's this software, uh, this tumbler software. Mm -hmm. So means uh, uh, means uh, so using this software, uh, what we have to present in the assignment? Yeah, I think you will. Uh, you would have measured the intensities as a function of distance in the first experiment, yes. and uh, you might want to uh, present those measurements as a function of distance, uh, either in a log log plot. Okay, where uh, yeah, for that uh, for that we have the so uh, we have a source transmitter and we have a receiver. So this stimulus software yes. is not using there. We are not using. We are not taking any help on this software. No, you are using it. So you are measuring the power at the receiver, right? So without yes. receiver, how will you know the power is in? Yeah, the receiver is giving you the measurement, right? Yes. Whatever software you use. So is working is working in tandem with the uh, receiver hardware in your system, be it laptop, be it uh, uh, your um, um, Android phone. Yeah, we have uh, we have downloaded one this Wi-Fi analyzer app. You know, Correct. On the smartphone, 
uh, justify who, who's who's uh, yeah. result is correct. Yeah. So first thing to ensure is that both of you uh, uh, have checked the frequencies you are using. Many of the routers or many of the uh, these uh, Wi-Fi devices uh, have a choice of frequency. Either it can be 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. Okay. Right. Of course, since our uh, the situation we have at hand and what we want to study in terms of reflector location is all tied to the wavelength being considered. Right. right. So if the wavelength itself is different, uh, it's not surprising that uh, the two groups might get different results. So first thing is to make sure that uh, while comparing either the frequencies are similar or at least the, the similarity has been accounted for in understanding. Uh, okay, so uh, I think Jyotirmay Pramanik says, I like to answer this question. Uh, okay, so you want to go ahead, Jyotirmay? Oh, which question he's offering I am, to answer? I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, yes. <laughs> just a, just Sagar Vishas asked this question. Means uh, uh, means he got the um, peaks at two centimeter and uh, uh, and ten centimeter. That mm -hmm. means what I am saying. Uh, so for his case, he is from this uh, graph. He is getting lambda equal to eight centimeter. Okay, but uh, I think he has used a two point four gigahertz source for this mm -hmm. back reflector experiment. So if we if we calculate that uh, lambda equal to suppose c equal to f, f into lambda, so lambda will be c by f. So if you put this, you will get 12.5 centimeter. Means uh, what, where, wherever they get the peak, difference should be lambda should be 12.4 centimeter. This is my uh, answer of this his question. Uh, you are also uh, giving the answer same thing. Means uh, as uh, no, yeah lambda yeah. For 2.4 yes. gigahertz, lambda is 12 centimeters. 12 centimeters. And so we expect the peak. The peak yeah. of the lambda. So, so difference between two consecutive peaks will be 12 centimeters. But you yeah. got 8 centimeters. So that's, that is one uh, uh, discrepancy. Yeah, so wh why the difference is I'm getting? Yeah, yeah. So, there, see, the, now you can now you realize that um, already that uh, if the the significant variation is expected on lens uh, on lens scales associated with the quarter of lambda or fraction of wavelength you will find that you need to make measurements at fine intervals of this reflector spacing it can happen that you know you have you will of course get multiple peaks okay it's not that only one peak will occur. Wherever the coherent addition, in-phase addition of the reflected wave happens with the forward coming wave, you will see enhancement in the signal. So it's not necessarily only at three centimeters uh, and, uh, you know, probably uh, what uh, nine centimeters you might have multiple peaks as long as you ensure that the phase difference is integral multiple of two pi including the phase attained by the reflection the reflection adds a phase shift of pi and the extra path length will add appropriate phase shift Together, it should be multiples of 2 pi. And there will be many distances at which this situation will be satisfied. So please don't be surprised if you get multiple peaks. Of course, the, the contribution from reflected signals where the reflector is far behind the radiator will, of course, the, there will be reduction in the signal level. Uh, if that distance happens to be significantly large compared to uh, your uh, overall distance. Hare 
I don't know whether that answers the exact concern you had about seeing different results from different people in, within the group. Uh, can, can the distance of the receiver might uh, have any effect? Or yes, I think the the distance of the receiver should not have any effect as long as we are not changing the distance between the radiator and the. Uh, no, I mean, uh, because uh, if I if I did with one one distance and uh, other other uh, other student, if if they did with another distance, will will uh, that shift the? Yeah, the the shift can matter if the any one of those measurements are done from distances that are too close to the radiator, because too close to the radiator, even the, the proper. Uh, interference between the reflection has not happened yet okay okay it requires certain distance for things to develop uh, and those are you know equivalent of the fraunhofer distances okay so given typical separations you need to go sufficient distance away before the effect of combined effect of it can be felt properly So it is advisable that you stay at a reasonably long distance compared to the wavelength so that this being short antennas, small antennas compared to the wavelength, the frown of our distances are also not very large. So what people say as a near field situation and the far field situation, uh, distinction, you will be in the far field regime if you are sufficiently far away. And then you will see the combined effect of this radiator arrangement with the reflector uh, without getting affected by the near field effects. In fact, even in your um, experiment of uh, uh, the inverse square law verification, you will find if you go too close to the radiator, you will find you might depart from the from the inverse square law. Okay. okay so that's uh, something uh, depending on the size of the antenna and, and so on and so forth. So there is no one rule I can specify right now at to what distance onwards you will see uh, more reliable uh, inverse square law mm -hmm. in print. But roughly a few wavelength away, you will certainly be in the regime uh, which is, uh, you know, safe enough to begin to see the inverse square law. Okay, all right. Uh, I mean, uh, so while submitting submitting this uh, thing in, as a group so what should we uh, i mean exactly submit so we should we should write those theory uh, experimental result discussion all these thing or we should write we should just show the result only uh, yeah you need not uh, repeat the standard textbook theory okay yeah. but whatever is required to uh, help the arguments you might put forward okay in explaining uh, your measurement you can you know uh, crisply mention that so some discussion uh, should be uh, written right yeah i think uh, it would be nice that you interpret your results and try to understand them and you have your own commentary on it, on it right because remember that uh, in any one of these experiments um, one may not get the ideal, ideal uh, patterns, right? Right. And there will be uh, good reasons for why it appears different. And appreciation of those is equally important uh, as much as the essential theory uh, that describes what is expected in ideal case. Means your suggestions, uh, actually Sagar and myself in same group, so I have seen his results. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, uh, 
So uh, he has taken many your uh, suggestions that you told that so, okay he is using 2.4 gigahertz source so mm -hmm. for that wavelength is 12.5 centimeter. Right. And he took the uh, data uh, from 0 to 13 centimeter means one lambda. Mm -hmm. And he got the wavelength means uh, wavelength from the graph this x versus uh, power it is eight centimeter. So your suggestion is if he no no I think uh, yeah getting the wavelength from these measurements is uh, is subject to no because we are, one may not have uh, uh, you know sampled finely enough to detect the real peaks and so the distance between the peaks may not be very as accurately uh, defined as would be required to estimate the wavelength from it no, for, for his result peaks are very prominent it is at two centimeter right. and 10 centimeters is clearly seen. Right. So of course, uh, it will also depend on where exactly the location of the antenna is within the device that one used. <laughs> okay. He has used a cell phone, smartphone. <laughs> and suppose uh, for another uh, member of our group, of our group, uh, Suti, uh, he also, she also did this experiment. And uh, suppose for uh, she got multiple peaks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 consecutive peaks. Yeah. And for our experiment, uh, wavelength is suppose uh, 3 centimeter only. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be not an acceptable result. Why not? Because uh, lambda should be uh, nearly equal to 12 centimeter. No, no, uh, no. It's not only. necessary. You can use any source. I think it is the relation in principle that is important, not the exact numbers. See, we are not trying to, if you are referring to the example given in the, uh, in the report uh, or the write-up of this, we don't have to reproduce those results because they are uh, for a certain situation, okay, certain tendency of it, uh, of the radiator. In, as long as the principles uh, are uh, checked out, right, you might have different results for a different radiating frequency. And they are perfectly okay. No, our, our source are monochromatic. It is Pardon? Monochromatic source means uh, giving single yes. wavelength. Yes. Yes. So twelve point four five centimeter wavelength. Yeah, but there could be a source which might be working at five gigahertz. No, no. Yes, yes. We are, we are mentioning the source. Yes. We are, we are sure about the source. This two point mm -hmm. gigahertz. Sub, so twelve point five centimeter is the wavelength. So then, uh, this distance between two consecutive peaks should be nearby about the twelve centimeter. My, uh, my point is because it is uh, it is the superposition of the uh, forwarding wave and the reflecting wave. So yeah, yeah. so the first peak should there. occur. First peak should occur uh, at uh, three centimeters. I am saying just the separation between two consecutive peaks. That is the wavelength. Pardon? No, 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 it's, it's half the wavelength. Because it's a to and fro distance travel, okay, the first peak will occur at 3 centimeters for a wavelength of 12 centimeter, the second peak will occur at, the, the, the dip will occur at 6 centimeters, Because at 6 centimeters, the distance traveled will contribute a phase shift of 2 pi, but the reflection has caused additional phase shift of pi, and in fact, there will be cancellation of the signal. And then the next peak will occur when you move further by another quarter uh, wavelength, which is 9 centimeters. So, what will the separation between two consecutive crest? The crest or trap? The phase shifts? No, separation, distance. Center. That's what I'm saying. I just explained that. So, was, was it clear what I explained? No. Okay. When you are at lambda by 4 distance, when the reflector is at lambda by 4 distance, the wave travels to and fro a distance of 
lambda by 2 which gives a phase shift of pi an additional phase shift comes because of the reflection together that makes it 2 pi and the reflected wave now appears in phase and which adds constructively to the forward going signal this will give you typically 3 dB increase or factor of 2 increase in the signal. When you move the reflector away beyond this point, you will reach at some stage a distance of lambda by 2. At lambda by 2, the to and fro travel of the signal, of the reflected signal, is a wavelength. A wavelength will add 2 pi phase difference and an additional phase difference remains from the reflection which will make it 3 pi phase shift. 3 pi phase shift will uh, may ensure that there is a destructive combination or interference between the forward and the reflected wave and that would give you less signal to the extent that the intensity of the uh, reflected signal is comparable with the forward going signal. And the next better situation will occur when the distance is 3 lambda by 4, which is in the case of 12 centimeter wavelength will be 9 centimeter distance of the reflector. When again the situation pretty similar to quarter wavelength separation would occur. So this is my understanding. If you have any differences of opinion, please uh, bring it up. Thank you. So, any questions? I guess there are no questions. Maybe we can stop for today. Yadesh? Okay, yeah. Second? I'm fine. I guess there are no questions. Maybe we, uh, yeah, like uh, on Monday, still, if you have any doubt or if you want to share your result or you want to discuss, so we'll, we are meeting Monday on Monday again. So we can discuss uh, on that time and we'll further discuss today's talk. And based on today's uh, uh, like lecture or talk by Desh, if you, have, if you have any doubt, we can discuss on Monday. Is that fine, Desh? Yeah. Uh, okay, Chalega. So we'll see you on Monday again. Thank you, everyone.